Hello, I'm Tom Pickering. Thanks for taking the time to listen to my talk, The Bayer Tapestry, A Chronicle of Genocide and the Blueprint for Apartheid. I'm going to use a Pecha Kutcher format. 20 slides of 20 seconds each, high energy, content dense. We are used to seeing the Bayer Tapestry as a contemporaneous historical document, which describes the foundation of English society, and indeed it is that. But remember, it was prepared by the victors and is entirely self-serving. Here, William takes allegiance from Harold, who promises him the throne. It's very convenient, very probably not true. What the tapestry is, in fact, is a document of the start of a still ongoing thousand year cultural genocide. The detail here shows a Saxon family being burnt out of their homes by invading Norman soldiers. Just like Americans in Vietnam, Nazis in Russia, Russians in Ukraine right now. This is a war crime. And it destroyed English culture. What you see on the screen, that's actual English. The language of Beowulf. It's not what we speak today. Our language got colonised. Our culture got taken over and suborned. And in an insidious way, we have two words for many things. The word for the nice thing, which comes from the French, and the word for the less nice thing, Old English. Lords eat pork, French, which comes from pigs, English, that serfs look after. The lords eat beef and live in mansions. The serfs live in houses and herd cows. No other modern European language has this class-based distinction. It's very, very strange. And then this change was pushed down into society itself. Anglo-Saxon England was a peasant landholder society. People lived in agrarian communities and voted for their leaders, right up to having a king who was elected by a council called the Witten. Local big men had long houses, like Herod from Beowulf, Rothgar's Mead Hall. The chief sat and dined with the people in large communal spaces, and the divide between peasant and nobleman was small. There was a social divide, for sure, but it was small, and this was very clearly a fledgling democratic state with a chosen king. This all changed when the Normans took control. There was a rampage of looting and pillage based around building huge stone Moat and Bailey castles all over the newly occupied territories. Nothing tells an underclass, we own you now, quite like a great big castle full of armed thugs on an artificial hill built by slave labour. And these castles were used to enforce a brutal regime of punitive taxation. The very first large-scale survey of England was the Doomsday Book, commenced in 1086 to enable William to parcel out the country amongst his followers and collect the maximum amount of taxes which the people could bear. This coincided with a profound normalisation of the entire mechanism of government. All three branches were affected. In modern terms, executive power was reserved to the crown. To this day, King Charles is the 23rd great-grandson of William. Since 1066, the descendants of the Normans have been in control of the British crown and its executive power. Legislature, as set up in the years following the conquest, was initially entirely based on descent from the original conquerors. To this day, the English government has an entirely hereditary component to it. Shown here are members of the House of Lords in robes from the 15th and 21st century. Finally, the judiciary was taken over. England and Canada has common law, based on the feudal code direct from the Norman knights. Contrast this with civil or Roman law used in the rest of Europe and Quebec. Go to law school, you still have to learn some basic phrases of law French. At a non-governmental level, the great institutes, which still serve as a socialisation and norming space for the English ruling classes were established. This slide shows a high school, a high school, Eton, founded in the 1400s. Oxford was 1096, still the foundation stones for a system of privilege which runs the country to this day. My high school did not look like that. So England became a totally fractured society, with an established upper class who owned the land and a lower class of serfs, near slaves, who were bound to the land and their lord's service. There were attempts at rebellion. When Adam Delve and Eve Span, who then was the gentleman? That was the slogan of the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 brutally repressed, and their leaders publicly tortured to death. Other tales of legendary folk heroes, like Robin Hood shown here, do exist. All of their attempts at rebellion failed. Not one succeeded. Then the Normans, 
took this style of government and feudalism all over Europe, then into Africa and Asia. They were everywhere. France, England, Italy, then Turkey and Tunisia all fell under the Norman boot. But their centre of power really stuck with England, and that was where they built Phase 2 from. Because, remember, the social hierarchy put in place in 1066, still in place today. The same ruling families were able to carry on this rampage in Elizabethan and Victorian societies to give us the British Empire that carried on until 1948. It's still Norman rule, perpetuated by the Norman-Saxon divide, which still drives British society to this day. 1% of the population in England still owns 70% of the land. And those are the direct descendants of the Normans. The best way to be rich, according to England's richest man, is to be of Norman descent. We see that along with Norman common law and the English language, the notion of class-driven lack of social mobility was exported worldwide. Commonwealth countries are notably absent from this list of the top socially mobile countries. And that leads me to stand with the anti-colonialists. Heroes like Gandhi, Bolivar, Mandela, Brother Ho, the Kurds, the heroes of the Orange Shirt Movement and Standing Rock. I salute them all and I wish them success because I've seen what happens if a people do not successfully rebel and it is really, really bad. A thousand years of bad. 